Okay, so here we go. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samudasa. Homage to him. The worthy one, the fully enlightened one, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So tonight what we're going to do is we are going to listen while I tell you a little bit about um, what happens with the Buddha's daily routine which someone reminded me I was going to do this tonight. It's not very long. So then as soon as I finish, we'll go into Upakalesa Sutta. And uh, this is Upakalesa Sutta is really one of my favorites. I spoke to you a little bit um, online about that uh, because it brings up the way that the Buddha was talking about handling the hindrances is one of the most important things because this sutta gives us 11 different uh, hindrances, not just five. The five are in there, but 11 different distractions that will happen and what to do with them. And this is where taking his advice really, really pays off, okay? So this one is the Buddha's daily routine, and this is by Narada. The Buddha can be considered the most energetic and the most active of all of the religious teachers that ever lived on earth. <clears throat> the whole day, he was occupied with his religious activities except when he was attending to his physical needs. He was methodical and systematic in the performance of his daily duties. And his inner life was one of meditation, <coughs> excuse me, and was concerned with the experiencing of Nibbanic bliss while his outer life was one of selfless service for the moral upliftment of the world. Himself enlightened, he endeavored his best to enlighten others and help them liberate themselves from the ills of life. His day was divided into five parts. Namely, number one, the forenoon session in the morning time. The second is the afternoon session. The third is the first watch. The second, uh, the fourth one is the middle watch. And the fifth one is the last watch of the night. The forenoon session, usually early in the morning, he surveys the world with his divine eye to see whom he could help. If any person needs his spiritual assistance, uninvited, then he goes. Often he goes on foot and sometimes by air using his psychic powers and converts that person to the right path. And Gulimal is a good example. He saw Angulimala in his mind. He knew about uh, his whole entire story. He knew he was supposed to go to meet his mother on the path. And that would have been the last person of 1,000 people he was supposed to kill. And then he got there first. And then he works with Angulimala and when he's finished, Angulimala comes to become a monk. And someday I will do the story of Angulimala in full for you here. I like to tell that to children and to people who don't know much about it because 
that story is remarkable how the whole thing, the whole story of his, how it started when he was going to school when he was young and how it ends up in the end. It's a wonderful story. Now, as a rule, he goes in search of the vicious and the impure when he searches for them, but the pure and the virtuous, they come in search of him. An example of that is the potter shed where the prince who was a prince in a Northern country gives up being a prince, becomes an ascetic, and he uh, is traveling to find Godama. Godama knows what's happening in his life, what's going to happen to them, to him also, and comes across him at the potter shed and then teaches him uh, what he needs to know, the core teaching of the Buddha Dhamma. And then he, uh, the story ends the next morning. For instance, the Buddha went of his own accord. Oh, look, they're talking about it too. Accord to convert the robber and murderer Angulimala from the wicked demon, Alavaka, but pious young Visaka, generous millionaire, and the generous millionaire, Anatha Pindika, and intellectual Sariputta and Mogalana came up to him for spiritual guidance. So those wholesome came to find him, unwholesome, he went to find them because he knew they had the potential to become Sotapanna Sakitagami. While rendering such spiritual services to whomever it is necessary, if he is not invited to partake of alms by a lay supporter at some particular place, then he, before whom kings prostrated themselves, he would go in quest of alms through alleys and streets with a bowl in his hand either alone or with his disciples, standing silently at the door of each house without uttering a word, keeping metta in his mind the whole time. He collects whatever food is offered, places it in the bowl and returns to the monastery. Even in his 80th year, when he was old and in in different health, he went on his rounds for alms in Waisali. Before the midday, he finishes his meals. Immediately after lunch, he daily delivers a short discourse to the people, establishes them in the three refuges and the five precepts. And if any person is spiritually advanced, he is shown the path to sainthood. At times, he grants ordination to them if they seek admission to the order, and then he retires to his chamber for rest. The afternoon session comes next. After the noonday meal, he takes a seat in the monastery, and the bhikkhus assemble to listen to his exposition of the Dhamma. Soon some approach him to receive suitable objects of meditation according to their temperaments. Others will pay their due respects to him and retire to their cells to spend the afternoon. After his discourse, or exhortation to his disciples, he himself retires to his private perfumed chamber to rest. If he so desires, he lies on his right side and he sleeps for a while with mindfulness. Just a moment, the dog brought the bowl to me and dropped it on my foot. I have to give him some water, just a moment. smart dog. I don't know why they think they're stupid, but he's really smart. Yeah, you're smart. Okay. <laughs> 
After his discourse and exhortation, he, his disciples and he himself retired to the private perf perfume chamber to rest. And if he so desires, he lies on his right side and he sleeps for a while with mindfulness. Why does he lie on his right side? He lies on his right side so there is no pressure on the heart. It is the reason. On rising, he attains to the ecstasy of great compassion. This is the way he starts his, his afternoon session. Maha Karuna Samapati. And he surveys with his divine eye the world, especially the bhikkhus who retired to solitude for meditation and other disciples in order to give them any spiritual advice that is needed. And if the erring ones who need advice happen to be at a distance, there he goes by psychic powers, admonishes them and retires to his chamber. Now I tell you a sh short piece here, but we really thought one of the greatest things when we were living, developing Dhammasukha Meditation Center on the mountain location, the first location was very steep and rugged. And we all thought that, um, you know, it was, um, okay. <laughs> it, it, we all thought that it was a good place. Um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, just one second, I think. My buddy here, he has to go out in the other room. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Out. Out. Here you go. Okay. Oh. Okay. I think we're okay now. It's always an adventure here. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. We thought one of the greatest things in the stories that we heard about the Buddha, there were six of us in the beginning on the mountain, and we liked it when Bhante told us about once there was a mountain temple, and at the bottom of the hill, there was a place where the monks would come together for stories from the Buddha and listen to lessons. And... Um, they all gathered down there, and but the 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 uh, Buddha realized there was this one monk. He wasn't there. He said to the monks, "Where is he?" And they said, "Well, he's still up at the temple." And they said, "Well, we can't start unless he's here. This is the rule we have at Dhammasukha too. You cannot start until everyone is there for the Dhamma talk or the prayers in the morning. One of you has to go and get him, and so." One monk said, I'll do it. And he, he went up to the door of the temple and he knocked. And um, when the door was open, there was a monk there. But he looked inside and he saw there were many, many monks, like 11 or 12, just cleaning the entire temple. And so he was a, a little shocked and he went down the mountain. He told the Buddha, you know, there's 11 monks up there, not just one. <laughs> and the Buddha said, no, 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 I'm sorry. Please go back up. And when you get to the door, open the door and clap your hands. And the monk will come to the door. It'll just be one monk. And he went back up and he clapped his hands. And immediately, they all became one. And he said, the Buddha is waiting. And then they walked down the mountain. One of the things that also the monks were able to do was to pass through a solid wall. And I was very impressed with this. I really wanted to become one, become many, because there was so much work to do on the mountain, clearing land and big piles of brush that had to be systematically burned and wood chopped, just everything. I just thought it would be so great if we could just multiply. <laughs> but uh, every year I would go down to the house at the bottom of the uh, mountain and I would get there on January 1st every year. And I would walk and say, now, everyone was, they would say, oh, she's here. Yeah. 
And I would say, yeah, I'm here. All this is a mistake. I'm here. Even that's a mistake. And then I would, and they say, you know, I'm here to walk through the wall. And then of course, I would just concentrate on not being there and nothing and start walking and bump my nose every year. It was a good giggle before lunch. And thinking about why is that happening? Because I am going to walk through the wall and these nouns, they very much get in the way. And you just can't even conceive that this is possible. And yet we know that people can do that sort of thing by passing through, but by not being there enough and the in their brain, the wall is just <clears throat> the atomic atoms and that's it. And, the, and this goes through this like that and they can walk through and come back. So it's just fascinating, but it never did work. <laughs> it was like fun. Towards evening, the lay followers would flock to him. They would come to hear the Dhamma, perceiving their innate tendencies and their temperaments. With the Buddha eye, he would preach to them for about one hour. And each member of the audience, though differently constituted, would think that the Buddha's sermon is directed particularly at him. This is something that happens with Bhante Vimala Ramsey when he's teaching. Many of us have said it felt just like you were speaking directly to me because we interview you every day. And so when things come up, where we decide to use a sutta to teach you, we are doing the best we can for the group in the retreat to meet everyone's needs. The Buddhist sermon is directed right to each person, and such was the Buddha's method of expounding the Dhamma. As a rule, the Buddha converts others by explaining his teachings with homely illustrations and parables. And many people know I love the whiteboard. <laughs> I always work with the whiteboard because some of us can learn by seeing more than hearing or reading. And then you take the seeing, the reading, or the hearing, and you are expected to do check out and investigate each thing he's teaching the next day. So to the average man, the Buddha at first speaks of generosity, of discipline, and heavenly bliss. This is the dana sila bhavani, right? Dana is the generosity, sila is the discipline. And then he gives the bhavana as you start it, heavenly bliss here is PT coming up is joy. And to the more advanced, he speaks on the evils of material pleasures and on the blessings of renunciation. And to the highly advanced, he expounds to them the Four Noble Truths. And by expounding on the Four Noble Truths, he's, he's implying, it's implying the ways that you can use the Four Noble Truths, which is a lesson unto itself. I think there was a lesson we put in the foundation series, four different ways that you can use the Four Noble Truths in your life through the, through the Buddhist teaching. So on rare occasions, as in the case of Angulimala and Kema, did the Buddha resort to his psychic powers to effect a change of heart in his listeners. And Kema, in this story, that Kema was a queen and she did not particularly like the Buddhist teachings, but she was intrigued by how he looked when he was teaching and she went to the door to watch and he sensed what was happening and how to change the way she listened to him. And so what he did was he had a beautiful woman appear right beside standing there while he was teaching. And she watched this beautiful, beautiful woman. And then she started to age and she went all the way from this young woman to age through her middle age, elderly years, and just turn to dust and bones and fall on the floor. At that point, she saw Anicca very, very clearly. And she saw the suffering of being attached to the way people look. And then she sat and started to listen more intently and she became enlightened. 
His psychic powers offer an effect a change in the heart of his listeners. The sublime teachings of the Buddha appeal to both the masses and to the intelligentsia alike, just the way today, the same thing. A Buddhist poet sings a song, giving joy to the wise, promoting the intelligence of the middling and dispelling the darkness of the dull-witted person. This speech I do is for all people. And then there is a mention here of uh, the uh, Buddha Chaku, which constitutes the knowledge of one's inclinations to the Asayas and the innate tendencies, the Asaya Nusaya, Nanna, and how to watch these and the knowledge of the dullness and the keenness of the faculties, such as how sharp is your confidence? How good is your mindfulness observation? Do you have the right quality of concentration? Is it productive concentration? Is your energy balanced properly? And your wisdom, is that coming up properly? And this is the Indriya Para Paryanatana Nana. The Nana is the practice of watching these things. Both the rich and the poor and the high and the low renounced their former faiths. They embraced the new message of peace. And the infant sasana, which was inaugurated with a nucleus of only five ascetics, it soon developed into millions and peacefully spread throughout central India. And the first watch of the night, we have three watches of the night. The first watch of the night, the period of the night extends from six o'clock in the evening till 10 p.m. I've often said this the wrong way. I always say it's seven to 11. It's six o'clock at night to 10 p.m. and was exclusively reserved for instruction to the bhikkhus or the students. And that's how we use it six to about eight o'clock is for the instruction period for Dhamma talks in our retreats. Unless we're doing a special one, it might be four o'clock to six o'clock if it's not a residential one. During this time, the bhikkhus were free to approach the Buddha and get their doubts cleared up, question him on the intricacies of the Dhamma, obtain suitable objects of meditation to advance and hear the doctrine directly from the Lord Buddha. And the middle watch of the night, during this period, which extends from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., celestial beings such as devas and brahmas who are invisible to the physical eye approach the Buddha to question him on the Dhamma. And an oft recurring passage in the suttas is, now when the night was far spent, a certain deva of surpassing splendor came to the Buddha, respectfully saluted him and stood at one side. In several discourses and answers given to their queries appear in the Samyutta Nikaya, You'll find a whole section in there. And when we say sasana, what we mean is the dispensation of the Buddha. Now, in Buddhism, one of the things we like to clear up, we say Buddhism a lot, but Buddhism is very, very, very fractionalized. And, you know, it's not controlled. And there's so many schools, you can't count them. In the United States, there's over 45 at this point. And this keeps going, you know. Um, so this is like what's happening with Buddhism that way. But what we are interested in is Buddha Dhamma. When I was teaching in Sri Lanka at the university in Colombo, all of a sudden they decided to mark this a special way. If you get extra points, if you point it out as Buddha Dhamma, instead of Buddhism, when you're talking about the teachings that the Buddha is 
teaching concerning core teachings. So it was the process that was in 2015 and it sort of leaked around to different universities started to pay more attention to this because of what is happening in modern times. So this is when the Davis come in and you can read more about them in the Samyutta Nikaya, you can find section about that. And the last watch of the night, is this is the small hours of the morning extending from two to 6 a.m., which comprise the last watch are divided into four parts. The first part is spent in pacing up and down. Chankamana, and this serves as a mild physical exercise for him, but not slow, not slow. It's an exercise, remember. Now, during the second part, that is from 3 to 4 a.m. This is an interesting time because in India, there are some gurus who want you to join them from 3.15 to 3.45 and claim that if you are in deep meditation at that time, but you have to be in an aware state. You cannot be in absorption. That's not what they're talking about. Totally aware. You, you can have some interesting experiences because in this last watch of the night, this is the lowest point of active consciousness surrounding you where you live. This is how Bhante taught it to us. And when everything is super quiet, it allows you to open up into the deeper states. He mindfully sleeps on his right side, again, to protect his heart. During the third part, that is from 4 to 5 a.m., he attains the state of arahatship and experiences nibbanic bliss. For one full hour, from 5 to 6 a.m., he attains the ecstasy of great compassion, the maha karuna Samapati. And that's sitting in the extreme level of compassion, okay, where you're just engulfed in compassion going out to all sentient beings everywhere and radiates through the loving kindness towards all beings and softens their heart. And at this early hour, he surveys the whole world with his Buddha eye to see whether he could be of service to any people. And the virtuous and those that need his help appear vividly before him, though they may live at some remote distance away from him and out of compassion for them, he goes of his own accord and renders necessary spiritual assistance. Now the whole day, he is fully occupied with his religious duties. Unlike any other living being, he sleeps only for one hour at night. For two full hours in the morning and at dawn, he pervades the whole world with his thoughts of boundless love and brings happiness to millions of people leading a life of voluntary poverty, seeking his alms without inconveniencing any person, wandering from place to place for eight months throughout the year, preaching his sublime Dhamma, he tirelessly worked for the good and happiness of all until his 80th year. According to the Dharma Pradipika, the last watch is divided into these three parts. And according to the commentaries, the last watch, it consists of three parts. During the third part, the Buddha attains his ecstasy and great compassion. It's, it's set up a little differently in the commentary. So that's all they really gave you about the daily routine. It's a pretty good outline, pretty precise of what's going on. And do you have any questions about this outline for the daily living? Anyone? Can you think of any? Okay. Write it down. We'll have another time at the end here. So when we go on, we look at the, the 
Upak Kale says an interesting thing I mentioned to you, the first section, when I read it, you'll, re you'll catch what I mentioned online to you. This is called the imperfections, which is vastly an account of three monks living together who the Buddha visits to look at how harmony is working for them to live together. And also he's asking them what's happening in their practice. And what's happening is they're getting interrupted by hindrances and he it then brings a, a recounts to them, which you will hear uh, the hindrances he faced in his own practice and what precisely he did with that. So thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Kasambi in Gositas Park. <clears throat> and on that occasion, the bhikkhus of Kasambi had taken to quarreling and brawling, and they were disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. And then a certain bhikkhu, he went to the Blessed One and paying homage to him. He stood at one side and said, Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus here at Kasambi have taken to quarreling and brawling and are deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. It would be good, venerable sir, if the blessed one would go to these bhikkhus out of compassion and the blessed one, he consented in silence. Now, I want to just tell you briefly, this was a very serious thing because it was happening just before the rains retreat began. These villages near Kasambi, surrounding Kasambi itself and Kasambi had stored up much food for all of these monks for the rains retreat to begin, which is uh, three months long. And the problem here was there was a group of monks who were Vinaya monks, and they were specialists in the Vinaya rules. And then there was a group of other monks who were meditators, and some were also uh, students of the Dhamma, studying the Dhamma in different ways. And they were different from the Vinaya group. And the, the second group, uh, one of them made a mistake and he made water, and then you're supposed to empty the bucket and not leave any water um, in the bucket at all for the next person and set it up the proper way for the next person. But what happened, it was done incorrectly, and it's not a major offense. This is not a major offense. But then it began to be a... Uh, a group thing where the Vinaya monks made fun of them for not knowing this rule and were speaking openly about it. And then the others were defending themselves saying, you know, this is not a major thing and we've apologized very carefully to you. And it kept getting worse and worse. It seems these things build upon a comment which builds upon a comment, which builds upon a comment, which is the same as today. And the Buddha was uh, trying to help. So let's hear what happens. And the Blessed One went to those bhikkhus and said to them, enough bhikkhus, let there be no quarreling and bra brawling, wrangling or dispute. When this was said, there was a certain bhikkhu who said directly to the Blessed One, wait, venerable sir, let the Blessed One, the Lord of the Dhamma, li live at ease devoted to a pleasant abiding here and now. We are the ones who will be responsible for this quarreling and brawling and wrangling and dispute. For a second time and for a third time, the Blessed One said the same. And for the second time and for the third time, the reply was the same. And they said, We are the ones who will be responsible for this quarreling and broiling, wrangling and disputed, basically saying, go away, Buddha, go sit under a tree. We'll take care of our problems ourselves, if you can imagine. That's basically what this was. And then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he entered Kasambi. 
for his alms. And when he had wandered for alms in Kesambi and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he set his resting place in order. He took his bowl and outer robe, and while standing, he uttered the stanzas. When I read these stanzas, I often think of our governments and Congresses and Senates. Listen and see what you think. When many voices shout at once, he said, none considers himself a fool. And though the Sangha is being split, none thinks himself to be at fault. They have forgotten thoughtful speech. They talk obsessed by words alone. Uncurbed their mouths, they bawl at will, and none knows what leads him so to act. He abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me, and in those who harbor such thoughts like these, hatred will never be appeased. He abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me, but in those who do not harbor such thoughts and hold on to them like these, Hatred will readily be allayed. For in this world, hatred is never overcome by hatred. It is only overcome by non-hatred. That is a fixed and an ageless law. And those others do not recognize that here we should restrain ourselves. But those wise ones who realize this at once they end all their enmity. Breakers of bones and murderers, those who steal the cattle and horses and wealth, those who pillage the entire realm, when even these can act together, why can you not do so too? If one can find a worthy friend, a virtuous, steadfast companion, then overcome all threats of danger and walk with him content and mindful. But if one finds no worthy friend, no virtuous, steadfast companion, then as the king leaves his conquered realm, walk like a tusker in the woods alone. Better it is to walk alone than it is no companionship with fools. Walk alone and do no evil at ease like a tusker in the woods. And then having uttered these stanzas while standing there, the Blessed One went to the village of Balakalonakara. And on that occasion, the Venerable Bagu was living in the village of Balaka Kalonahkara. And when the Venerable Bagu saw the Blessed One coming in the distance, he prepared a seat and set out water for washing the feet. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The Venerable Bhagu paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side, and the Blessed One said to him, I hope you are keeping well, Bhikkhu. I hope you are comfortable. I hope you are not having any trouble getting alms food. The reply was that I am keeping well, Blessed One. I am comfortable. I am not having any trouble getting alms food. It is a common question we ask as monastics expect to hear from one monastic to another this question if we have not heard from them for a long time and we are calling to talk to them. It's a common question. Are you getting enough food? Do you have shelter? And then the Blessed One instructed and urged and roused and gladdened the Venerable Bhagu with talk on the Dhamma, after which he rose from his seat and he went to the Eastern Bamboo Park. And on that occasion, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Nandia, and the Venerable Kimbala, they were living at the Eastern Bamboo Park. 
And the park keeper saw the blessed one coming in the distance and he told him, do not enter this park recluse. There are three clansmen here seeking their own good. Do not disturb them. But the venerable Anuruddha heard the park keeper speaking to the blessed one and told him, friend, park keeper, do not keep the blessed one out. He is our teacher, the blessed one who has come. Then the venerable Anuruddha went to the venerable Nandia and venerable Kimbala. And they, he said, come out, venerable sirs, come out. The teacher, our blessed one has come. And then all three of them went to meet the blessed one. One took his bowl and his outer robe. One took a seat. One set out water for washing the feet. The blessed one sat down on the seat, made ready and washed his feet. And then those three venerable ones paid homage to the blessed one and sat down at one side. The blessed one then said to them, I hope you are all keeping well, Anuruddha. I hope you are comfortable. I hope you are not having trouble getting any alms food. We are keeping well, blessed one. We are comfortable. We are not having any trouble getting alms food. Well, I hope, Anuruddha, that you are living in concord, in mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Surely, venerable sir, we are living in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing and blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. But Anuruddha, how do you live in this way? Venerable sir, as to that, I think this way. It is a gain for me. It is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions in the holy life. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards these venerable ones, both openly and privately. I maintain venerable acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. And I consider, why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? So then I set aside what I wish to do and I do what the venerable ones wish to do. And we are different in body, venerable sir, but we are all three in one in mind. And venerable Nandia and the venerable Kimila. Each one spoke in the same way, adding, that is how, venerable sir, we are living in concord, how we are living in mutual appreciation without disputing and blending together like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Good, good, Aniruddha. I hope that you are all abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. Now he's asking about them how they get through the day with chores. Surely, venerable sir, we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. But Anuruddha, how do you abide thus? Venerable sir, as to that, whichever one of us returns first from the village with alms food, prepares the seats and sets out the water for drinking and for washing and puts the refuse bucket back in its place. These are the instructions, how to do this today. Still here, set up very clearly. Whichever of us returns last eats any food that is left over. And if he wishes, otherwise he throws it away where there is no greenery or drops it into water where there is no life. He puts away the seats and the water for drinking and for washing. He puts away the refuse bucket after washing it, and he sweeps out the refectory, the kitchen. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing, 
or the latrine are low or empty takes care of them. And if they are too heavy for him, he calls someone else by a signal of the hand and they move in together by joining hands. But because of this, we do not break out into speech. And every five days we sit together all night discussing the Dhamma. That is how we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. Good, good, and Neruda. But while you abide thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, have you attained any superhuman states? Have you reached a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? A comfortable abiding? Well, venerable sir, as we abide here diligent, ardent, and resolute, we perceive both light and vision of forms. Soon afterwards, the light and vision of forms disappears, but we have not discovered the cause for that. So now at 16, section 16, he begins to give them instructions. Now you should discover the cause of that, Anuruddha. I will tell you before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too perceived both light and a vision of forms. Soon afterwards, the light and the vision of forms disappeared. I thought, what is the cause and the condition why the light and vision of forms disappears? And then I discovered thus, doubt arose in me. And because of the doubt, my concentration fell away. The concentration fell to a lesser degree that was not productive for him to continue watching. This is what this means. And when my concentration fell away, the light and the vision of forms disappeared. I shall so act that doubt will not arise in me again. Another thing is we, we realize in students when we're teaching sometimes that if a student is concentrating hard, focusing very hard, that brings up these forms and scenes and things like that that are will not get out of the way so you can just watch what would happen if there was nothing no pressing, no, no uh, type of tension or tightness. And so if you lighten up to retune the quality, the strength of the meditation, it allows you to get to a productive level. What is a productive level means that the productive level allows you to watch inside without disturbance of such things arising. As Anuruddha, I was abiding, diligent, ardent, and resolute. I perceived both light and vision of forms, and soon after the light and vision of forms disappeared also for me. I thought, what is the cause and condition why the light and vision of forms have disappeared? And then I considered thus, perhaps inattention arose in me. And because of inattention, my concentration fell away. When my concentration fell away, the light and the vision of forms it disappeared. I shall so act that neither doubt nor inattention will arise in me again. Now, this um, inattention, the actual attention to a progressive meditation that is moving down the path properly is not an attention on a single object. It is actually an attention to the quality of your mindfulness observation so that you can see from the peripheral points in, and see have a vision screen in front of you. It's not just a tiny area or like this that you are working with. It's actually a visual perception inside when you close your eyes. And if you watch, you begin to understand what you are able to learn that way. As Anuruddha, I was abiding diligent, I considered sloth and torpor arose in me. And because of the sloth and torpor, my concentration fell away. 
And when my concentration fell away, the light and vision of forms, it disappeared. And I shall so act that neither doubt nor inattention nor sloth and torpor will arise in me again. Now, when we're looking at these, the um, hindrances and we go through this, we have to carefully take note of one thing. What the Buddha is doing is, he is letting go. And when he lets go, he sees first that it's an imperfection. It takes you away from where your actual observation is supposed to be. Watching the movements of mind's attention, moment to moment, object to object, so that you can see clearly the impersonal nature of it and how it continues to change clearly. And what's happening here is, is saying, basically, if there's sloth and torpor, the concentration fell away. It fell out of tune and has to be retuned again so that you can watch and just see what is there in the present time. With clear vision is light and forms are just what's arising and passing away, arising and passing away. Okay. I shall so act that neither doubt nor inattention nor sloth and torpor will arise in me again. And Anarudha, as I was abiding, diligent, ardent, and resolute, I perceived both light and vision of forms. And soon afterwards, the light and vision uh, disappeared. I thought, what is the cause of this light and vision falling away? And then I considered thus, that fear arose in me. And because of fear, my concentration fell away. And when my concentration fell away, that upset what I was able to see inside. The light and vision of forms disappeared. Now, suppose a man set out on a journey and murderers leaped out on both sides of him. And when fear would arise in him because of that, so too fear arose in me, and this light and vision and forms disappeared, and I shall so act that neither doubt nor attention nor sloth and torpor nor fear shall arise in me again. So now he is identifying something about these that is systematically happening that comes out in the end of the sutta, and when he sees this similar thing for each one of these things, how they come up and arise impersonally and how they fade away again without him asking them to. He begins to wonder, you know, um, this is an imperfection that exists in my ability to continue watching the development of my practice. As Anuruddha, I was abiding diligent um, ardent and resolute, I perceived then elation arose in me. And because of elation, my concentration fell away. And when my concentration fell away, then the light and vision of forms disappeared. And the, this elation that arises is like, oh, this like very Elation, you're just elated that it's here and you want to see more of it, but you don't need to see more of it. And when you do that, the eye is jumping up, wanting to see this, the atta, and you let go and step back and everything settles down again. He says, suppose a man seeking one entrance to a hidden treasure came all at once upon five entrances for the hidden treasure. And then elation would arise in him at that, and so to the elation arose in me. And then the vision and form is my ability to watch what's happening in the present time in my, in my meditation. That's what fell away. And I shall so act now that neither doubt nor inattention, in, uh, inattention nor sloth and torpor nor fear nor elation would rise in me again. So he's collecting all of the different types of things that arise up that cause an imbalance and a change in his mindfulness. His power of observation is affected. 
as an Aruda, I was abiding, diligent, uh, ardent, and resolute. I perceived uh, the light and vision of forms, but soon afterwards, the light and vision of forms changed because inertia arose in me. And because of inertia, my concentration fell away. And when the concentration fell away, then the light and vision of forms disappeared. I shall so act in the future that neither doubt nor inattention, nor sloth and torpor, fear or elation or inertia would arise. And inertia is just not being able to watch anymore. It's like an inability to keep going. And it's a blockage. The thing about this is we have to look carefully in the text to learn how the um, how the hindrances are arising and how they're operating. And when we examine it closely, we find some very interesting things that these uh, little uh, these hindrances have a life of their own that operate on a specific thing and it takes food to keep them going. Now this food for these types of uh, experiences that are coming up, these, these, these um, adjectives, descriptive things like the fear, the elation, the inertia, excess of energy is one of them. Deficiency of energy is another. Longing is another. Longing means I'm longing to get to Sotapan. I'm longing to get to the fruition, longing to get there. That will block you, this desire, this kind of longing that floats inside you and you want, 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 want it, okay? And then you have a perception of diversity that can arise in you when you're trying to watch only what's happening, but the diversity goes here to think about outside this way, this way, and I can try this way and try that way and apply this to get to see this or that. And there's such mixture of diversity in instructions can cause you a large problem in your meditation for the progress to continue. And the last one is excessive meditation. So when we look at this whole thing, where he's gone through is doubt. And then he says, the next one is inattention, sloth and torpor, slow, dull mind drop in energy, drop in attention, drop in curiosity for that one, fear arising in me, not understanding how fear arises. And when it arises, it can be um, a blockage if you don't understand what to do with it. The elation, the inertia, not being stuck, stuck still, excess of energy, too much energy applied, pushing, causing tension, tightness, Deficiency of energy, not enough strength to keep doing the observation, losing stamina. And then longing, we said, and then perception of diversity. And the last one is excessive meditation upon forms. Excessive meditation upon forms is interesting. We were on the mountain once and Bonte's coaching us every night, you know, uh, and um, he comes out to a Dhamma talk and he says, now tomorrow, I don't want you to do anything. And we all looked at him like, what are you talking about? We have to go out and we should be practicing all day and we should be practicing it. No, he said, I don't want you to do anything. I don't want you to work at seeing anything. I don't want you to meditate tomorrow. I just want you to go down to the bottom of the mountain, have fun, go swimming in the river, then come back up at the end of the day. So we did. When we came back up for the Dhamma talk at the end of the day, one of the questions he asked was, how was your meditation today? And a couple of us said, you know, we didn't meditate at all. We didn't. All we did was we smiled all day and we were nice to each other and we helped each other and we had a picnic and we went swimming and it was a really wonderful thing. And then we came back up here and he said, great meditation. We were applying the loving kindness, the forgiveness, the applying compassion with each other, no matter what was happening. We were living it in a day of putting our feet in the cold water in the river and just relaxing. It was a wonderful thing. Recently, I had a retreat with the nuns, uh, a group of nuns in a nunnery in Pune, 
there was a 10 day retreat and they were doing so, so well. And then I could sense this where they were all of a sudden, they were caught in sort of a kind of feeling it was going to drop off. And I said, okay, tomorrow, I don't want you to meditate as heavily. It's up to you if you do your sessions as many hours, but I don't think you have to for one day. I wanted to see what would happen. I have never done that before. Well, they went away and they skipped that day. And then we had the Dhamma talk that night. And the same thing happened when I asked them how things went, all kinds of little tiny incidents the mentioning in the kitchen when we were down in class, you know, walk, taking a walk to the, to the city outside the gate. Everything was going so well. We were so kind, so full of joy, so full of happiness, and we shared. And then that was what happened. When they came back, they picked up really fast with their meditation. At that point, they were making really good progress. And unfortunately, I have a doorbell, so we just wait. <laughs> this is always an adventure here. The water's already here, so let me go take care of the doorbell just real quick, and I'll be right back because we can't let it go here. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Now, so we go to the end of the sutta. And when we look at the last part of excessive meditation of forms, what it's saying is basically too much meditation, too much concentration on the objects, and not enough observation of how things arise. And what you are basically talking about in this, when you are talking about what happens, he says to you, when I understood, so this is, this is the important part, when I understood that doubt is an imperfection of mind, what is it that he is discovering is that when he 
understands that if he pays attention to it at all, it becomes an obstruction. To really understand this, you need to go from where you read in 27, section 27 of 128. Go back to 22, number 22, which is Aligadupama Sutta. And when you go to 22 and you look at section 10, there is a statement that is extremely important. When we're talking about the hindrances and what's causing you trouble in your meditation, what happened in 22 is the most important statement I have ever seen in the text, explaining precisely what you do that is wrong pertaining to your hindrances. So when we come back to the beginning of that sutta, we, we basically hear the, hear the Buddha say to the person who is confused. And how was the person confused in 22? The, this was a monk, his name was Arata. The monk Arata believed from, as he was beginning to learn the teaching, it was okay to engage a hindrance. You may not engage a hindrance. And here's why. He says, misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? This is section six, 22 section six. Misguided man, have I not stated to you in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions. How do they become an obstruction? How do they disturb you and stop you them in the meditation? And how are they able to obstruct one who engages in them? You see? So this is the thing. He's basically telling you an obstacle never becomes an obstruction until you personally pay attention to it. You are feeding it nutriment. You are feeding it food by personal attention. This is where anatta becomes a big part of the management for hindrances. If we, we take the, the different topics in Buddhism and we go to several different places and cubbyhole each thing we're talking about, we never come to realize, and this is what has vastly happened in Buddhism at this time. The very idea that we should consider this hindrance a enemy, that we should consider it so important we must destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suffocate it, subdue it, suppress it, it's endless. And yet when we go to the text carefully, we only find that approach in a few places that it is heavily emphasized, but vastly in the surrounding suttas again and again and again, we find, never mind, let this go. Re just relax, come back. We find you, if you practice the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, the twim, we're giving you the steps of right effort. That's what twim is. Number one, to recognize that this is an unwholesome mind state. And here we're saying, recognize in, in 128, you're saying, I recognized that this was uh, an imperfection of my mind. I abandoned it, that imperfection of mine. And he goes through all those pieces that we just talked about very, very clearly. He says, when I understood the doubt was an imperfection of my mind, this means you recognized it. I abandoned the imperfection of mine. But then we have to look also at right effort in its whole statement. Right effort has four steps, not two steps. And then we can go to modern neuroscience and say, how does the brain learn something? It learns that by letting go of the, the, the hindrance, the disturbance, and letting, recognizing and letting go is only 
the purification step, but it must be supported by the retraining of the brain in the other two steps. And those other two steps were to bring up a wholesome and replace it. So when we're showing you TWIM, we are showing you that when you recognize the doubt, then you release the doubt, relax your mind, smile and come back and keep watching. Now you have replaced the doubt by observation. And what is observation? Observation is your mindfulness. Mindfulness is the observation tool, okay? Meditation is the actual activation of this observation and keeping it going. You see, so we say, up, meditation is the tool of the of the Buddha in order to see this everything. Okay, it's the tool, the method he uses in the, in, but the observation itself is the skill, the mindfulness skill of observation, and it has a talent. Yes. It has a strange talent where it can, it reminds you, it has memory involved with this. Observation has memory involved so that it recollects that you must do all those steps of right effort in order to retrain your mind. Now, where's the neuroscience in this? If you go and just go into, spend an evening just for half an hour, it doesn't take much more than that. If you go and put the Boolean statement into the search engine for Google and you say, how many years does it take for me to change a bad habit if I'm over 25? How do you change a bad habit? Or how do you stop a bad habit if I'm over 25? There's lots of research on this. This research is 15, 20 years old now. And what they're showing you is if you let go of an unwholesome mind state, that would be an imperfection of your mind. <laughs> and you let go of that, then you must replace it with a wholesome one. The smile works very quickly. That's how come we use this. How do we uplift the mind very quickly back to the proper level where it functions fully capacity, full capacity for the observation to keep going? Smile, <laughs> smile. Why does it work? What did they find medically? What did they find that makes this so it absolutely worked? There is a, a there is a um, connection between the corner of your mouth and we were, you know, it runs up to the corner of your eye and into your brain inside and it helps you to separate the two lobes so that they're not tight anymore, pressing against each other inside, just slightly. Then the pineal gland is free to release a few endorphins and things and make helps you to reach yourself the level of the uplifted joy. That's how it happens. Yeah. Can we move around in jhana? We certainly can move around in first, second, and third jhana. It's tough when it gets into fourth jhana, and then mental states, it's very difficult to move around. You can walk very slowly and maintain it if you get up slow, and you were in infinite space, and you got up slow and started to walk a line back and forth. It could continue to happen, but it's not functional in life. But can you go to work? Can you go to work and look closely at the pieces that are involved with the first and second jhana, for instance? Take a look at those and you can have first or second jhana at work. If you can keep a smile going while you're going through what you're doing in the office or you're teaching in the class or you're working at school or you're working in the library, if you keep smiling, your brain will stay open more and you will have more power more brain power to work with. This is what we're trying to tell you. What makes people more intelligent when they're Buddhist? <laughs> Somebody said Buddhism makes people more intelligent. I don't understand what you mean. Makes you more intelligent because you learn to stay right here, not tight like this, but you need to stay right here and keep working in the present time. Yeah. And that's what's so marvelous about this. The, the solution of using all the time using right effort to get yourself through 
uh, to change the mind. And what you're doing in the neuroscience, they're saying you have neural pathways in your mind. And the fact that you were anxious or angry about something and taking not being able to do it fast enough or something or irritated with something, you know, and then um, you, you learn how to let go of that. And then you start again, you come in more steady and strong and you start to get in balance. So every part of this is all interwoven together when you learn the basics. When we put, when we take you into a retreat, in 10 days, we're teaching you two things, a Dhamma course and a meditation course combined, side by side, parallel teaching. Why are we doing that? Why? Because the progress report, the modes of progress that the Buddha was judging his own monks on was composed of two points, not one point, not just their meditation, but their meditation is one part and the comprehension of the Dhamma was the other part and how they work together is the answer. And that's what makes it so we can go through. That's what makes it so we can pass through. Yeah. So that's what this was. And when he tells Anuruddha in the end, he basically says, you need to understand what is the cause and the condition for this. And when you con considered what the uh, this on the occasion when I do not attend to the signs of forms, but I attend to the sign of light, I then perceive light, but I do not see forms. And when I... Uh, on occasion, will attend to the sign of light, but not attend to the sign uh, to attend to the sign of um, of the forms. I then see forms, but I do not see perceive light. Even for a whole night, or a whole day, or a whole day, and a whole night, if I work that way, that I can see things only what's in the present time very, very clearly is what this is talking about. Okay, so in the end of this, he's basically saying that what the solution for all of these hindrances is, I abandoned those imperfections of mine. I let me now develop concentration in three ways. And then it goes into how to develop your concentration to proceed on the path. He's talking basically, he is talking about um, going through the jhanas at the end, reaching path, going down the jhanas, and um, taking you all the way down to the level of equanimity, and then all the way through to experiencing cessation and nibbana. So you're going through one, two, three, fourth jhana, making it so that you can go through the subsections of the sub parts of the fourth jhana, we say five, six, and seven, which is infinite space, infinite consciousness, and, um, and nothingness. And then the last one is neither perception or non-perception. These things you can read about very, very clearly in David's book. And that book is, his book is basically the path to Nibbana. So you can find this online. You can find this over at uh, Dhamma Sutra Meditation Center, and where this starts, that's the most value in this is page 67. When you're beginning practice and you're starting at that point, taking you through this, this uh, each part of the each jhana and explaining it super, super clearly, giving you a really good little diagram of this, which we share with you when we teach on the jhanas, showing you how you go one, two, three, four, and then it sets you up so you can go through the mental state of infinite space, infinite consciousness, neither perception or non-perception. So that's basically what happened here. And, and he straightened Anuruddha out by saying, don't get upset over these things, but see how they come up impersonally. And once you realize their imperfections and they're not going to allow you to continue to observe, you abandon them. You relinquish them. You let them go. You allow them to be there. And they will fade away if they are not fed nutriment. And the nutriment I'm talking about is your personal 
Henchman. So I take questions now on this, but at the end of the Sutta we go, that is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Arnaruta was satisfied and he was delighted in the Blessed One's words. Any questions? Hmm? Uh, How are you doing? I've, I've got one question from quite early on in the sutta. Um, and I think it was Anuruddha who was saying that uh, uh, if I felt there was something I need, needed to do, uh, um, no, uh, I set aside what uh, I wanted to do uh, for what others wanted to do. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the others would say the same, uh -huh. uh, which is which is great for Concord when you've got that know. agreement and that commonality. Um, but, but what about in situations where others don't necessarily have that approach? And so from your point of view, you're not expressing preference, but you're prepared to uh, work with that uh, ease and flow. Um, but others maybe uh, don't have that same perspective. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, but it's like this, okay. Um, you know, recently I, um, I had an adventure with someone who really didn't like to visit um, a particular relative, you know, and, and they always were harassed and stuff there and always demanding and always wanting to tell the person how to live their life and everything like that. I've been through this before in several situations. And um, Part of this, when you're dealing with somebody like that, you know, is you go in, it's up to you what you do. You're responsible for what you do, number one. You're not responsible for this other person, what they decide to do. And so it's, the problem is that when you're still caught in Atta to a large extent, sometimes you get upset with the other person that they won't play the game too. You know, this happens even with small children. But why won't you play? I've got the ball. We have to play. You know, don't feel like playing, but we should play. <laughs> you see, you know, it's kind of that goes back down to even that little example. But what I told the person was, you know, you need to you know this person for a long time. This is an elder. You want to respect the elder. They are part of the family in that case, and they really love the person. So, the question we ask ourselves is why is this person acting this way to begin with? But we don't want to get in a big conversation. We just want to listen. So when we start listening to the person and you've already decided you're going to decide that way, step back and allow them. I'll tell you a good example. Step Bonte steps back and he just allows me to pack the pack the truck when we used to travel. <laughs> He had ideas about that, but you ever see two people have an argument about packing a truck with stuff that before you're going on a trip, and it, it's sometimes a good thing in the relationship just to step back, but the other person doesn't want to step back. So you see, both of, what what's the real core of what is going on here? It's two autos, isn't it? Two autos. Yeah, it comes back to autos. So you're choosing to practice on a tap. Well, then practice. Yeah. And just let it go. And you have to remember, it doesn't matter. And you have to remember, Anicca, it's over, it's gone, it's behind me. So now I'm going to stay in the car. Remember this story about the, the car? And, um, and the, basically, I was telling somebody last night, they were totally surprised at this. And they said, that's so perfect. It's really crazy. And I said, yeah, it is perfect. You know, here's a little car going along. And it's, it's traveling along the lifeline and something happens here, you see? And when something happens and you make a decision, you're going to practice on a towel, then when it's finished, you have to just leave it alone and let the car go by. And it comes out here in the back. But the problem with people is as much as you want to practice on a towel is after the incident, because you're a little irritated under there somewhere that they didn't want to practice oh, on a ta too, you know? And so you tuck it in the trunk of the car, you put it inside here and you carry it along with you. And you're, there's a little irritation there that they didn't want to play too. You can't make the other person play too. 
but show them the benefit of what it's like to just allow things to flow and smile. <laughs> Keep smiling through the thing. You see? So what, the, what this sounds uh, to me is, is like uh, it's like a tug of war. And you can only have a tug of war if both parties hold the rope. You can only have a tug of war if there's two atas involved. Yeah. 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 So if one party lets go of the rope, there is no tug of war. That's right. It's done. Yeah. It's like, you know, Bonte and I were talking about this the other day about a couple of things. And it said, remember, you just just walk away. And I had seen him do it in, in, in over the years a few times. And I said, yeah, it was easy. Just walk away. And I said, he said, it really is easy. And I said, yeah, I've done it a few times now. Truly, truly, just just simply uh, just simply walk away. And then there isn't anything happening. Two people have a war. But if one walks out of the room, it's over. Two people have an argument, but if take if two people aren't there, if the other one left the room, well, then there can't be an argument. But the big one was me as a teenager when I look back at this and the problems that were going on in my family with certain members of the family, not just with me, but amongst everybody was having problems, is we our family just didn't seem to understand you could just hang up the phone, which gets even more funny. <laughs> You can just hang up the phone, you know, when somebody is really dig digging at you and going after you and everything. Uh, that's it. It's over. Just hang up the phone. There's no connection. So essentially, you, it's like two people. One leaves the building. Well, here I am. So now this person has a choice. Sit down and gripe about it for the rest of the afternoon or let it go and keep moving forward. You see? But some perspectives on that might uh, feel that uh, that approach is avoidance, simply walking out and not. Uh, why? Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Why would I avoid trying to change you? Why? Because there's some knowledge involved in the fact that you cannot change another person. Mm -hmm. It isn't possible. It's only fake, and it always boomerangs back on us. Okay, but it, you're skirting. You know, if you keep. I used to do the same thing. I would skirt the issue, skirt the issue and say, yes, yes, yes. And go out and tomorrow I would do it again. Till one day it just hit me, you know, I'm avoiding the truth of anatta and atta. I'm avoiding it. You see? So if you're going to choose to play the, and uh, take the anatta line and start living it, well then do it. But you can't change the other person if they're caught in their atta. I mean, the only way the Buddha, uh, he never tried to change the person. He only brought, he only showed up and the people had the problem and he would present it in an organized way for them to decide to change it themselves. You see, and they, he would lead them into a trap sometimes of having to repeat what he said until they heard it very clearly and they got it in their brain and they understood it. And then they took the correct action and started going in the direction of the correct, uh, and correct mean, what does correct mean? What does right and wrong mean? It means operational or non-operational, uh, or another one is effective or not effective. Another one was careful or careless. You see that we do this in Buddhism. That's the kind of writing we see. It's careful speech or careless speech. Okay. It's effective action or ineffective action, meaning there would be no harmony. And harmony still comes back to harmony being probably the most uh, uh, effective one. Uh, the results of this whole thing, there is harmony. That person that you walked out of the room to avoid the argument, okay, uh, to, to avoid it, the, um, the argument from happening is left there in a position of um, choosing to interpret the perspective of what just happened. It's up to their perspective, isn't it? And the perspective is what? Personal or impersonal. It take the fact you left, uh, you know, the room, take it really personally, you abandon. I said something at a meeting once. I said, I tried to explain one tiny thing about how, uh, how uh, was not working about operating correctly in one of uh, a, a, a teacher who was working at the university. You know, I, 
was one tiny thing was not quite operational. And the person said, why are you condemning that person saying they're a bad teacher? I never said they were a bad teacher. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where'd you get that perspective? So that person chose to take a tiny thing and say you, the other person said, whoop, like that. You see, have you had that experience? I think everybody has had that experience. I don't think I'm alone with it. You know, um, in talking to students or listening to them talk to me about it, I think it's happened a lot in the world. Yeah. So a person's perspective, this is teaching you about the perspective you choose to take um, is based on understanding the past and the truth of what it is and the future and what that is and choice of staying in the present time. And this present time is not effective. It's not effective for me. It's not effective for the other person. Well, then one of you leave and the other person can make a decision for themselves. Maybe they want to go and, um, you know, uh, well, you know, there's all these different um, religions. Maybe someone wants to go and pray for forgiveness or confess something and then forgive or any number of other solutions. But for us, it boils down. If we keep boiling it down to the finest point in deductive reasoning, um, it comes to the place where taking it personally or impersonally and how long are we going to keep carrying that by by putting it in the trunk of the car and carrying it around with us We're carrying it around yeah so everyone it's a good idea like once a week when you're working on this stuff to just take a look if you're making notes in a journal or something how much stuff did i put in the trunk this week <laughs> You know? uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Lisa. Um, apologies, I'm going to have to, to leave now. But uh, thank you for an excellent uh, uh, session today. <laughs> okay, you have a good one. Okay. Anybody else have a question before we cut this off? Hmm? Anybody else? Hmm? Okay, I know I probably invaded dinner time here. So let, let's come together and do a prayer before we leave. Okay. Wait, let's do that. Wait a minute. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. See you next week. Everybody have a really great week. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs>